So welcome to the final panel of the day. Uh, as you've probably been told in the previous um, session, we are merging the panels that were supposed to be going in parallel uh, for this session. So we'll have two presentations on the topic of uh, PNS in the making of futures, continuing from the previous uh, discussions in the other room. And then we'll do questions for those two presentations, and then we'll, we'll go, on, go on with uh, the two presentations on science policy interface. Yeah, so first up we have, um, ooh, sorry, Susana Nascimento, who is going to be talking to us about uh, looking into blockchain and other DLTs, please. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you all for um, being here and being awake. Uh, it's been a long day. <laughs> Let's see <laughs> how this session goes. Uh, so um, I'm very pleased to be here today to present um, the project blockchain for EU on behalf of the rest of the team and how we went about our dis transdisciplinary framework and approach. So uh, basically this was a project um, a research project coordinated within the European Commission, and it was um, done by the EU Policy Lab, the Foresight Behavioral Insights and Design for Policy Unit, which I'm uh, a part of, and it was supported by DG Grow, which is the Director General for Internal Market, Industry, Entrepreneurship, and SMEs. So, um, as uh, researchers and policy analysts at the um, at the GRC, it was a unique opportunity to be at the very start of what the Commission could do regarding an emerging technology such as blockchain, which is surrounded by a highly uncertain socio-technical landscape, so really at the core of also what a post-normal post uh, science or uh, world looks like. So the, the project had a particular focus that went beyond beyond the well, most well-known financial applications of blockchain that you may be more familiar with. Um, what interested GROW was basically how blockchain, uh, its potential to transform uh, industry and the economy. And so along these unfolding futures, uh, the blockchain project was mostly designed as an exploratory, uh, wide-ranging overview of blockchain for industry. So I'm not going into very detailed explanation of what a blockchain is. Uh, that's really not the purpose of the, today's presentation, but I will just give you really a very hopefully simple explanation that we are in the same page. So blockchain and other distributed ledger technologies enable parties who are distant or have no particular trust in each other to record, verify, and share digital or digitized assets on a peer-to-peer -peer basis with few to no intermediaries. Assets means it can be mo money, that's why you hear about cryptocurrencies, but it can be contracts, it can be records, uh, anything that has a sort of a digital format. Um, of course, blockchain is a particular type of technology, of digital technology. I'm not going into what makes a blockchain a blockchain, but it has some specific features and is characterized by decentralization, replication, transparency, time stamping, immutability, digital signatures, and also what you probably have heard, smart contracts. I'm not going into this technical stuff, but so, um, our, our objectives of the project were basically to map and analyze blockchain uh, um, existing, emerging, or potential applications for industry across a number of sectors and use cases, to scan and explore future scenarios of production, distribution, use, and then identify some uh, policy actions and provide science-based uh, advice on what is, what is coming. Um, so this exploration into the future of blockchain was done through a particular approach as a policy lab. A policy lab, we, like, we like to say that is a collaborative and experimental space for policy making. So we are backed by transdisciplinary research. We use an, a number of methods and tools to co-create, to prototype, to test public policies and services. So as you see here, we have a very diverse toolboxes and it comes from the expertise of our, of our multi disciplinary team. Um, we have, you know, scenario explorations in serious gaming, uh, behavioral interventions, uh, different forms of stakeholder engagement, and also collaborative creations or co-design. 
Um, in, the, in the project, the Blockchain for You, in particular, we combined science and technology studies with foresight and a little bit of horizon scanning, participatory and speculative design, and behavioral insights, insights to a lesser degree. But um, we try to develop the forward-looking and experimental approach uh, that allows us to address sort of the uncertainty and the complexity of blockchain applications at this moment. So we were dealing with a technology with potentially high but also very unclear technical, policy, um, economic, social, legal impacts uh, and also with a high degree of public controversy and conflict. So we were close in a way to a future oriented or foresight analysis when we were, since we were dealing with an emerging technology, what is its features, what is their um, development paths, um, possible impacts, but we were also very close to anticipatory governance in the sense that we generated ideas together with stakeholders um, on how blockchain could exist in the near future and ult ultimately test new narratives and plausible scenarios around it. So the project basically included a mix of desk and qualitative analysis and um, we did interviews, surveys, ethnographic explorations and together with a series of co-creation workshops. Just to give you sort of um, a very quick outline of these co-creation workshops. Wor uh, workshop A was the first one in uh, last year, in July, and it was mainly aimed at mapping the um, blockchain present and future challenges and opportunities. And participants were sort of a snapshot of the blockchain ecosystem uh, in industrial non-financial sectors. So here we made use of generative and critical design methods inspired by uh, Liz Sanders and Peter Jan Stoppers. Um, uh, the um, workshop B took place last November and here we, was really, we really went for the material prototyping of future scenarios of production, distribution, use of blockchain and other DLT applications. Here you see uh, we made use of participatory and speculative design methods. And finally, the workshop C, which was in March this year, we, it was more of a broad spectrum discussion on policy strategies for digitization of industry and businesses. So the audience was, um, were coming more from what we call the industry first responders or SMEs representatives, um, and uh, re really dedicated to how uh, SMEs could um, potentially adopt um, uh, 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 blockchain technologies. So um, at this point, I'd like just to stress at least two main points of our research. One that we, I think we very successfully implemented a participatory approach in the way that we in, in involved through these workshops and through all our research, a very wide and diverse community um, you know, of um, technical developers, of um, um, uh, experts in, you know, coming from sociology, from law. Um, uh, we also, uh, a lot of companies, a lot of entrepreneurs, also civil society organizations um, and uh, policymakers from public administration, other European Commission services, the European Parliament, the UN, OECD, the World Economic Forum. So we had a quite diverse set of, uh, of people um, contributing to this research. Um, and, and second, um, together with the conventional test desk research and qualitative analysis, we, we, we tried to were invested in pushing a bit of the frontiers of what's common in, in, in policy when it comes to looking into no, new technologies. So we did this through uh, the collaborative design and creation of five speculative blockchain prototypes. And here the, the term of prototyping for policy, it means, usually it means, um, piloting and testing of services between before you fully implement it or you scale, scale them up. But here we use them mostly as the creation of fictional artifacts to trigger forward-looking discussions. And here, they, these prototypes are like catalysts for uh, you know, better informed decisions and uh, around the, what are the preferred decision uh, directions of what's coming to build what's next. Um, again, it can be also a very compelling way, a very <laughs> digestible way to show how something might work. Or it can even be a learning uh, device attached to an imaginative leap uh, into, the, into the tomorrow. So the prototypes were built by five interdisciplinary groups and they were composed by designers, 
by um, technical experts, so developers, blockchain developers, and also industry, industry experts, and social and economic researchers. Um, policymakers from different commission services also participated uh, in workshop B, and they really contributed a little bit with their knowledge about the policy files and what were what, what their main concerns. So the prototypes were aimed at physically showcasing um, how blockchain could be applied in five sectors, energy, transport and logistics, creative industries, advanced manufacturing, and health. Um, I will show you a video of one of them. And the video is more suggestive than explanatory. So. What if everyone could access all information they need in a decentralized way before repairing something like a second-hand scooter? Meet Vantage Point, a speculative blockchain prototype in the advanced manufacturing sector. Vantage Point was co-created for the Blockchain for EU research project. To learn more, visit the blog of the Joint Research Center EU Policy Lab. Um, so, let me just put this. Okay. So, uh, what you saw it was Vantage Point. So, it uh, basically, I'll try to explain very quickly. It's a platform that stores uh, the digital twin of a product and um, it stores information about, in this case, a scooter, about um, the materials that were used, the physical qualities, the, the maintenance history, the certifications, the warranties, and it can be then accessed by any type of, uh, by a consumer, by a, an insurer. Um, uh, depending on what, what you need to access, what type of information you need to access. Uh, going very quickly into the other prototypes, you know, we developed the, the blood chain, which is basically an assets management system that um, uh, matches supply and demand of, for the collection and transport of blood and other sensitive biological materials. Um, we developed another one on the Care AI, which is basically um, uh, provides access to basic healthcare in exchange for anonymized uh, personal health data, uh, which is then connected through a smart contract to a data marketplace that is then accessible um, by different parties. Um, GigBliss is, is, offers three different types of models of hair dryers, uh, and they have different uh, models for energy uh, consumption and trading. One of them, for example, um, uh, autonomously trades energy in off-peak off times and trades energy with the energy grid or with other hair dryers too. Um, <laughs> Gossip Chain is probably one of the most speculative <laughs> ones because um, it allows anyone um, uh, to submit gossip to a blockchain when they're riding a taxi in a neighborhood and then the blockchain combines the people's reputation in a prediction market to assess the information's value and reliability. Um, I invite you <laughs> to access uh, more detailed descriptions of the prototypes together with other outputs such as the, the final report in our, in our page, in our blog, uh, where you can find everything. Um, I, in conclusion, I would just like to, to point out that you know, our policy um, uh, lab approach to experimentation and to the future, you know, we try to open up policy making processes through future oriented analysis. Um, one, for policymakers to be better prepared to deal with complex and certain phenomena and for also to allow them to have uh, a future gazing uh, made of different perspectives, alternative directions. How do you do this? Uh, again, I can just mention a few challenges or lessons learned through our research. Um, well, one, you need to be careful about how you frame the future. Um, all of this is needs to be anchored also in the now. So especially when it comes with an emerging technology, uh, you, you, it's hard to go too far into the future. Also because policymakers, their time frame is very short. It's very short term. 
um, there is, there was, and there is a constant struggle to bring, to take out the policymaker from an, a, a purely economic analysis or cost-benefit analysis, and to um, put into the table the social, the legal, the ethical uh, perspective into 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 the discussion. Um, it was there was clearly uh, an added value of bringing together different. Uh, um, stakeholders or experts with different backgrounds, so also very difficult because there are different languages, different interests, different agendas. But uh, in the end, with this, uh, in our co-creation workshops, I think we really managed to get people to work together and, and come up with some interesting uh, ideas. Um, finally, I think a mix of methods works works well in the sense that you can have you know your core literature review you can have the traditional outputs like reports but then uh, these unusual objects like prototypes they work very well one they are very powerful in attracting attention having uh, people interact with them um, but they are also they also help in the end to some underline some key messages to the policymakers, and that's really how you communicate to policymakers. really you have to really stress the key messages at the, at the very end so um, um, we are we are continuing our blockchain explorations, and um, our, this will be a project dedicated to, to blockchain and DLTs for social and public good. But in this case, we're going to do uh, we're going to co-design and launch an accelerator where we want to again put together governments, civil society, and public organizations with blockchain developers and companies. Uh, together with some experts uh, coming from different backgrounds and really trying to shape projects that that have a, a very clear social uh, impact. Uh, and here, you know, the cases will be very varied between um, uh, tracking of, of, of benefits, disaster relief, um, certification of, 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 of credentials. So uh, we're very excited also about this. So thank you. So um, I won't thank you for your wakefulness. I'm sure if, um, if you're even uh, twice as good as I am that at least half of you are asleep right now. <laughs> but the, the deck's been designed in anticipation of that. It's mostly pictures, so hopefully it will go down easily. Um, what I'm about to tell you, I understand that is um, effectively being in conversation with um, a fair amount of what uh, Susanna just said especially what she was telling us about fictional artifacts and how they can be useful in helping us um, uh, conjugate our thought towards the future, anticipation, obviously, in the sense that I'm presuming she, um, she meant when she noted Chari. Um, very nice speculative uh, advertisement there, by the way. Um, also in conversation with Saltelli's um, uh, keynote, um, his references to science fictional works as, um, among other things, anticipatory devices, I find really intriguing, but I'll be going slightly against, against the grain there. Um, we'll be talking about a science fictional work that um, distorts the present, all right, that it uses the future to distort the present, hopefully in productive ways. Um, th this talk also is in conversation with a few things that Jerry said to us in his video introduction, namely about the, uh, the political distortions that PNS might undergo as it goes further into a, a various number and varied number of types of political arenas. There are essentially three things that I want to do in this talk within the balance of what I just said. Um, I want to describe what I see as some dim sympathies between PNS and Afrofuturism, and I'll say a little bit, I'm presuming you have some sense of what PNS is, I'll say a little bit about uh, what Afrofuturism um, does. Um, secondly, I'll uh, use the, the film, the, Mar the Marvel Disney film, Black Panther, as an exemplar of what I describe in the first part. And then I'll um, run through a very short list of uh, questions about what I've just described, um, and uh, those questions will go to, to PNS's possible uh, futures. So this notion of dim sympathies, um, I've, I've stolen from Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Um, I made these slides on a Mac, so there'll be some distortions, um, as usual. Um, so uh, late 18th century, um, and this is from one of his uh, extremely famous poems, one of the conversation poems called Frosted Midnight. 
And um, he's contemplating in this poem um, sympathies between his own mind and a very small blue flame in this room where he and his, uh, his young child are, are sleeping. And despite the very different ontological states of the, um, the human, the, this fictional human, and the, the inhuman flame, he imagines that there's some, some consistencies uh, between them, these dim sympathies. Uh, Coleridge will bookend this talk, by the way. I'm interested in um, the analog of those uh, dim sympathies, um, uh, taking uh, perhaps as the Coleridge figure, Afrofuturism, and the, the dim blue, the light blue flame, um, PNS. So what about uh, Afrofuturism? Um, many people are, it, it's a pretty hot uh, domain if you've not heard of it. Um, lots of uh, discussion, um, mostly in Western speaking countries. Um, primarily among folks who are members of or are very interested in the uh, reverberations of um, uh, black transatlantic conversations. Um, I'm less interested in the definitions, more interested in the functionality, what happens there, the many things, there are two or three, three or four usually that I point to that are uh, kind of quintessential functions of uh, Afrofuturism. And I'll just very quickly go through a few of them so you can have some sense of what I mean. Um, the one thing that uh, Afrofuturists do that'll um, uh, resonate strongly with those of you who pay a lot of attention to, um, to science and technology studies approaches to thinking through science fiction is that uh, practitioners will, will take, uh, appropriate and redeploy tropes from science fictional works um, to the effect of altering the perception of a consumer, right? Someone who absorbs the, the fictional narrative, the intent will be to take a, a classic, almost cliched element of a science fictional trope and refashion it, reconfigure it, recontextualize it to the effect of really, in effect, doubling down on some of the traditional uh, effects of science fiction with a heightened impact for uh, especially for folks from um, Afro-diasporic uh, communities. So oftentimes I'll say that this is a form of consciousness raising in that first sense, um, R-A-I-S-I-N, raising, but also consciousness raising in the R-A-Z-I-N-G sense, slashing, cutting, um, perhaps reconfiguring. Afrofuturists are also very much um, concerned with what you might call chronopolitical incursions. Um, so by this, um, this rather clunky term, um, I hope that you'll understand uh, efforts to use time, conceptions of time, um, visions of futures, past, alternate presence, to use all of those things to very explicit um, political effects. And so in that 1967 image there you have um, on the left-hand side, Dr. MLK, and on the right, Nichelle Nichols, who played Uhura in the original Star Trek series. And there's a really fascinating story there. I won't go into great detail, but the long and the short is that um, after the first season, Nichelle Nichols was ready to leave that show. Um, then one evening after making her way through an extended ceremony in DC, I'm pretty sure, I should get a call from um, Dr. King, and this is Oh gosh, this is a year before he would be assassinated. And he tells her that he's heard that she wants to quit and um, he implores her not to. And she wonders why. At first she doesn't believe him. Uh, apocryphally, she hangs up and he has a call back. And so he tells her he doesn't want her to quit because that show and her presence on it is the only positive vision of a black future that's out there and available to him. It was the only show that he let his children watch apparently. Uh, a similar kind of um, effect and sentiment in the, um, the television show, the American television show 24 um, in 2001. Um, many theorists, including myself, we anticipate that this show did quite a bit to actually help President Obama, well then Senator Obama, become President Obama by showing yet another, um, in a kind of extended series of um, black uh, American presidents. This one quite compelling and interestingly enough, in the third season, that black president who you see in the third, the second of those three vertically oriented stills gets assassinated. There's also a, a functional quality to a lot of Afrofuturism that goes to uh, a re 
conceptualization of the history of black people in various circumstances such that um, those histories resonate with, with science fiction, um, particularly uh, modern black subjectivity uh, taken as um, a hyper form of modernism in effect, right? An emphasis on uh, radical homelessness, um, symbolic, material, uh, psychological, and in some ways, um, those of you that are students of um, modernism understand that that's, that's really a key element of it. And folks like Toni Morrison there and Cold War Oshun um, spend a lot of time using this, um, this transformation of that history to, um, again, kind of distance us from, uh, from traditional histories of uh, black people in the US and the Americas generally, um, in Europe as well and in Africa, but to the effect, again, of raising and raising consciousness in the ways that I mentioned. Specifically, the, uh, the transatlantic slave trade for, for folks that do that kind of thing is conceptualized as a, as a techno-social phenomena. Um, huge implications there, right? Um, such that um, slaves in the system in which they were enslaved um, constituted um, something like a, like a massive machine Right, that these were actually these people, even though they were not perceived as people then, would have been elements in, in a giant uh, device. Um, and in that way, you could understand, and I do understand, Afrofuturism as uh, kind of responding to a chronic uh, PNS state, a chronic one, um, in various parts of the world where you have um, black people congregated, um, effectively a chronic state of PNS for a large fraction of the black transatlantic, um, to use a phrase that Paul Gil Gilroy traffics in, accelerating just a little bit. That inheritance, the folks who come in the wake of those people, would be existing uh, right about where that arrow points. And so I'm, I'm quite obsessed with the, the y-axis of the, um, the classic icon of PNS. Black Panther, for me in this, um, and this tale works really well as, uh, as effectively an exemplar of uh, this mashup that I'm talking about, these sympathies between PNS and Afrofuturism. Um, what I'm saying to you here is kind of, it's effectively an extension of some of the things that I said in a review that I wrote for, um, for Slate uh, about this film. Um, if you haven't seen it, you should. Just by a show of hands, how many people have seen the film? Okay. So, uh, 40 percent or so. Marvel Disney film uh, released early this year. Um, global release box office now, or really um, this number, that 1.3 billion is from about three months ago. So it's done okay. Right? Um, the sympathies for, for me um, work in two ways, uh, diegetically internal to the narrative, right? I want to describe that first and then I'll say just a bit about the, um, the external sympathies or the external interactions. So internally, um, this, this movie is really quite obsessed with a fictional African state um, called Wakanda and it exemplifies what I mean by this, this chronic state of, um, of PNS. Um, this, country is um, based on a, a set of political responses to a series of techno-political catastrophes, and the first being um, a meteorite's impact that devastates the region in Africa. Um, it lands in the center of this country and turns everything upside down. This meteorite winds up depositing a, um, a really special uh, element. I won't go into the details of it. It's called vibranium. And this is the, the second political crisis. Once the people there realize that the meteorite is e extremely valuable, not only do they have to, to deal with regional contestations over who will control it and make use of it, but they then as well, since it's in, in most versions of the story, this is happening in the, the 17th century, they then also have to figure out how to, to deal with Western powers who, once they find out about this, will want to, to take it. Um, the, the strike also winds up um, modifying many organisms in the region of its, of its landing. And one of the, the byproducts of that is that a, a plant takes on, in a few generations um, after this mutation, takes on uh, a set of chemical qualities that, when treated properly, um, will induce a, a performance-enhancing set of capabilities in most humans. 
uh, the people who set up the political re regime to deal with those previous catastrophes not only monopolize the element, but they, they monopolize the plant as well for the solidifying their, um, their patriarchal authoritarian um, monarchy. Uh, in the real world, there have been a set of uh, really fascinating responses. Um, there was a, a previewing of this film several months before it was released to the public in the US um, that was a function of a collaboration between a, a young um, US uh, representative and a, a Disney executive. And the whole point of the showing at a congressional event um, was to, to boost STEM activities, right? Really quite interesting. Uh, Maxine Waters wound up going to Aretha Franklin's uh, funeral uh, a few days after her latest um, hostile exchange with the President of the United States. And that's her in that, that bottom slide. She winds up giving uh, the sign of Wakanda. This, this is a sign from the film. This is what she does upon entering the, um, the funeral. People are applauding her um, because of this fight that she's having with the president, and that's her, that's her response. It's quite surreal. Um, the film is also completely wrapped up in um, various phases of um, American culture wars, and so um, this is a Disney film. It's at the same time running around and presenting itself as a, a pan-Africanist statement. It's, it's quite uh, confusing for a lot of folks, and you can imagine the types of debates that are, that are unfolding there. There's a similar type of political struggle within the, the African diaspora. Um, folks from any number of African countries feel that this movie um, unjustly appropriates um, symbols, icons, um, even uh, patterns, um, fashion patterns, um, to the detriment of those countries without really understanding it. And Nedia Korafor, that's her next to the, the Black Panther image there, um, lays out yet a yet another critique, namely that Afrofuturism is uh, is much too um, too American centric. And finally, uh, a few months before he was interrogated, uh, the Saudi Arabian um, journalist working for the Washington Post, Khashoggi, uh, wrote a a really political review of the film and offered it up as a model for governance and reform for um, the crown prince who would, it seems now, I think we're all on the same page, would ultimately wind up having him uh, interrogated unto his death. The, the bookend, the last um, Coleridge uh, quote here, leads me to the, the set of questions. Um, in addition to being a great poet, he was a great literary critic as well, and, and justifying why he used um, fan, what we would call fantasy, horror, proto-science fictional notions, think about um, Kublai Khan, think about Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, why he used those modes to, to convey deeper meetings, many of them political. Um, he suggested that uh, and he tempered those modes, those extravagant modes, with just enough truth to allow a reader to suspend uh, their disbelief. It seems that that's a, uh, a strategy that is, uh, is now a, not just a literary one, but a political strategy, and so I'm I'm at the point now of wondering, uh, first of all, uh, and I hope these are interesting questions for you, first of all, what it actually might mean for, um, for the future of PNS uh, based on Black Panther's reading of PNS that it might be consistent, again, with a patriarchal authoritarian monarchy. Those problems, the problems that we usually associate PNS with are rampant there. And, Presumably, uh, there would have been some mode of engagement complicit with what we've been describing here. And what does this suggest to, it, to us? Again, this is in line, I think, with, with Jerry's um, video introduction. And there's, there's another question that I, that I have, but maybe I'll hold it um, since Nora held up the zero minute sign about five minutes ago. Yeah. I'll hold it. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you.